All right, hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So today we're gonna to be doing a quick portfolio update. We'll be focusing on the sectors that I invest into. We'll be looking at the specific stocks that I buy and hold. Then we'll be looking at the dividend income that I earn per stock, as well as the gain and loss as a percentage and dollar value that I have on each of my companies. Now, if that's some content you would be interested in watching, I encourage you to watch the video. And if you like it, give it a thumbs up and possibly subscribe to the channel. So without any further ado, let's go and dive right in. So this is my dividend growth portfolio that I manage myself. And we're gonna be looking at the specific sectors here that I have on my dividend growth portfolio. So about 21% of this portfolio is invested in technology companies. We have almost 20% invested into alternative asset management companies. I have a decent amount of cash here, almost 17%. I actually offloaded a bunch of stocks that I had significant gains on, decided to lock those in while valuations were high and build up some cash for some other positions that I would like to continue to build out. Then we have consumer discretionary, it's about 11%. Payment processing is 10%. Railroads have about 7%. Canadian banks, about 6%. US banks, 5% and real estate is about 2.5%. All right, so let's go and look at the actual stocks in this portfolio. So I'm just gonna make this a little bit bigger. So as you can see, my current top holding is Brookfield Corporation. I've made many videos on Brookfield Corporation in the past. I'll actually leave a couple in the description below. If you haven't seen them, I encourage you to check them out. Great, great company here in my opinion. They're in the alternative asset management space. So that's Brookfield Corporation and Brookfield Asset Management. Together, they make up about 17% of my total portfolio. And th these alternative asset managers, I've talked about them. They have great, great uh, tailwinds in their businesses. They take capital from investors, they charge fees, they manage assets, they earn fees on those assets, and then they reinvest that cash and they pay out small portions of dividends, they buy back shares. They also own and operate some of the most essential infrastructure in the world. So I believe they have a great future ahead of them. Now, Microsoft makes about 10% of my total portfolio here. And as we can see, Microsoft has had great growth over the past uh, couple of years. We'll have a look at it when we look at the position gain that I have on this position. But 10% here is a Microsoft, uh, one of the most essential companies in the world or in the technology space, providing essential software to businesses and people. And they have great, great cloud growth as well. Then we have Apple here, 6%. Now, if you've been watching over the past couple of weeks, Apple just came out with their own version of AI or what they call Apple intelligence. So this has been a thesis I've had for a while. A lot of people have been selling off of Apple or selling out of Apple. I've been adding to my position, increased it to about 6% because I look at Apple as a consumer essential, not a consumer discretionary. It's almost like a consumer staple. When you have over 2 billion active devices and you have that active install base, in, in my opinion, it's gonna be one of the best ways to monetize artificial intelligence. They, Your iPhone is essential. That's the way you interact with the world. Again, use computers or iPads, but your, your phone is with you all the time. So it, in my view, the, the thesis for my investment in Apple was that it was a great cash flowing company, generate a bunch of excess cash flow that bought back shares and pays dividends and has significant growth. But I had a feeling that they were going to come up with something significant in artificial intelligence or what they call Apple intelligence. So I decided to add to the position before and now it's increased about 6%. And I think they have a great future runway with growth. American Express, uh, it's about 6% of my position. Again, I've made videos on American Express as well. It's one of my core holdings, as you can see. I think it, they just have a great business model. Uh, the management there has created a huge moat around their business. They're appealed to affluent customers. Uh, very, very low credit charge. Also, like again, great, great company here, in my opinion. Brookfield Asset Management, we went over, makes about 5% of my position. CP Rail, uh, great railroad. Again, if you know me, you know I love my railroads. These businesses have a huge moat. You're not going to be building any new railroads anytime soon. CP Rail, with the continued uh, move of manufacturing and goods from 
uh, overseas over down into Mexico CP rail with that uh, rail rail line sorry from Mexico to the US to Canada I think they're in a great position here to continue to grow growth and as they continue to build out those synergies from that Kansas acquisition uh, that they made a couple of years ago I think it's just going to continue to turn into double digit earnings per share growth JP Morgan strong bank here uh, about 5% of my position then we have Visa, so 4% of my position here. Visa, along with American Express, they operate in that uh, payment processing space. De definitely different business models, like I've said before, but Visa just continues to generate huge amounts of operating cash flow, and it pays out dividends and buyback shares. So again, continues to grow here. Then we have Costco. So Costco makes up about 3.5 to 3.6% of my position. So Again, Costco, I really like Costco. Their business model is great. I think it's actually the one that I have the highest gain on. I wasn't able to build up my full position, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Then we have EQ Banks. This is a newer position. Uh, it's about 3.5% of my total portfolio. Great bank, a uh, lot of growth. This is more of a growth-oriented bank. So focus is more on the digital platform of banking. They don't have any physical branches. They do everything online. So that reduces their overhead required to operate. And then they can grow, grow at scale a lot more with a lot less cost. So they are a great bank. And they continue to grow dividends at double-digit rates as well. Then we have Amazon. So it's about 3% of my portfolio. I don't think I need to dive into too much about what Amazon does, but they have multiple business lines growing at over 20%. So they have their core business, they have their cloud business, they have now their new advertising business that is also growing like gangbusters. So a great, great company here. It's about 3% of my portfolio. Lows, I have about 2.8%. So I took profits here. I think it was closer to 5 or 5.5%. 5 .5%. I took profits here because I decided that I wanted to have some additional cash to build out some other positions, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I reduced it to about 2.8%. And when I look at it, I also have Home Depot, which is 2.2%. So that kind of gets me to my 5% uh, fully built out position. So I look at Home Depot and Lowe's as this oligopoly in the home improvement space. And I, I decided, I couldn't decide which one to own. So I decided to own both. I think they're both great companies. So Lowe's again, and Home Depot, they actually make up what I consider to be one position in my portfolio. Uh, added to KKR. So KKR is another alternative asset manager. Now, if you've watched my videos on Brookfield in the past, think about that, but on the Asian side. So on the Asian uh, side of the continent or the world, they do the same thing out there and they're heavily focused in Japan. I'm actually going to be doing a video soon on KKR. I watched a full five hour investor presentation. And I was very, very impressed. So I believe that they're very, very an analogous to Brookfield, but they're just on the other side of the continent, focusing uh, geographically with a concentration in Asia and Japan as well. Uh, now they do have some different business models, which I'll talk about in that video. KKR has traditionally been more focused on the private equity side, whereas Brookfield has been more focused on the operating business side. So they do differ in that sense by a great deal, but the fundamental business is still the same. They try to earn uh, earnings and then distribute those out from managing other uh, institutions, uh, assets as well but they've had a more traditional focus on private equity and also private credit but now they are starting to build out a infrastructure and real estate property business so I think that they are actually looking pretty attractive right now then we have National Bank so National Bank here great company uh, great uh, bank part of the banking oligopoly in Canada so almost two and a half to three percent of my position I'm comfortable with that they just announced uh, plans to acquire another Canadian bank so that's Canadian Western Bank and they're continuing to try to branch out and grow over Canada and I like the way they're doing it they're taking nice thoughtful steps on how they're going to grow their management has been very disciplined and I like their growth path or their trajectory for the future next we have ADC so it's Agri Realty uh, I reduced this. This was a almost 5% position. I would like to get it back up to 5% soon. It's at about 2.5%. So Agri Realty focusing in that uh, commercial leasing space. And they're very, they're very well capitalized. 
uh, they, they have what they call a fortress balance sheet. So not a, a lot of their debt is actually due for re-rating or refinancing for another three years. So no real huge debt maturities or debt walls coming up. The reason why I reduced it to uh, from 5% to 2.5% was I re decided to take some gains and, and focus on adding to my cash position here. Then we have ATD, so Alimentation Couch Tard. They are a convenience store operator. Uh, they have a great track record of earning double-digit EBITDA growth, earnings per share growth. Um, again, we're kind of in this weird period where it's it's hard for the consumer to afford these uh, convenience store prices. But with Alimentation Couch Tard, they, they are a serial acquirer. They acquire mom and pop convenience stores. And again, this space is very fragmented. So they have a lot of opportunity for growth. And the convenience store business, again, when it's, it's more, to, in my opinion, about location. So when they can acquire these mom and pop convenience stores in those specific locations, near apartment buildings, condos, those places where those grocery stores aren't really near there, then consumers really don't have a choice if you want to go down and get a bag of chips or some cigarettes or whatever have you. Again, I don't smoke, but a lot of people do. So if they have that specific location there and they don't have any other option, again, if you're getting a jug of milk or something, you got to go to that convenience store. So I see a long runway of growth there too. So that's about 2.5% of my portfolio. Home Depot I talked about with Lowe's. Union Pacific, again here, it's about 2% of my portfolio. Probably like to get up to 2.5%. I took some gains, built up some cash. I think I was up around 35% on this position. Uh, I was trading at the high end of its valuation range. Again, Railroads, one of my favorite businesses. Uh, huge oligopoly. You can't make any of the railroads. I think Union Pacific is going to have some great uh, efficiencies moving forward. And again, these are kind of irreplaceable businesses. They are just the most cost-effective way to to tra transport goods like I, I bought a car the other day which was great um but it was transported by the rail by, by the railroads and then picked up by a trucking company so again they're essential they're going to continue to be used to ship these bulk items then google had about two percent uh so again google is a great company they've been all over the news with their focus on search you're, you're watching this on youtube they have great, great properties, and now they're focusing on artificial intelligence. I have 2% here, and I'd like to probably build that out to about 3 to 3.5%. Then I have my cash, which is split between my U.S. cash and my Canadian cash. So when you look at all this, I feel pretty well diversified in my holdings and kind of top-heavy. So I've built out a lot of these positions that I like. So this first half here, essentially, I'm actually pretty comfortable with all these positions. I haven't been adding much to them. Brookfield I have and I said like Apple I did a little bit um, but I've been pretty consistent now what I'm focusing on with these positions is adding to these positions right here so I've built up this cash position I've locked in a lot of gains and I started to dollar cost average into some of these so Visa actually used to be about three and a half percent I've upped it to four percent and I'm trying to build this out to about six percent I think it's trading at probably fair value right now i don't think it's deeply discounted so i've been kind of seeing on the sidelines but it, it might be a case here where i might just need to bite the bullet and add to it at a pretty fair price again i, I think i'm up about 35 percent of my position we'll look at that in a minute but if if i'm if i'm thinking about it adding to it here and i'm holding it for the long term it might not be a bad idea of buying it at fair value because again great companies rarely go on sale so I might just add to that position, but I'm kind of hoping for a little discount. So I'm going to build this out to 6%. Then we have Costco. Costco's run up. Uh, I think I'm up almost 100% on this one. We'll look at the gain soon. It's about 3.5%. I'd like to get it to 5% of my total portfolio or even 6%. It's a great company, but the valuation on Costco right now is, is in my opinion, uh, super stretched. Like it's, it's huge. I think that the valuation has gotten a little out of hand. Again, it's a great company, but I don't want to pay the premium that people are charging on the stock right now. So I'll patiently sit and wait. I highly doubt I'll be able to get to my 6% target allocation. I probably should have built it out a couple of years ago when I bought it all and just went all in. But again, hindsight is, is always 20-20. You never know what's gonna happen. So at three and a half position, I'm comfortable. If I could get it to six, that'd be great. Otherwise, I'll just be holding my shares. Then we have EQ Bank. So I've built out about three and a half percent. I'd like to get this to 5%. Great Canadian bank, like I said. 
Uh, it's kind of un underappreciated, I feel like. It's It's got a great runway for growth here in Canada. It's only focused on Canada, so there is some risk. But I think it's trading at a fair valuation right now. Not deeply discounted, but pretty fair. And if it dips back down, I will be adding to my position, hopefully building it out to about 5%. Amazon has uh, got about 3% here. I'd like to get that to a 6% position. Again, Amazon is trading at a fair price, I think, right now. Um, I'm just going to continue to dollar cost average into this one and hopefully build that out to about 6%. Then we have lows, which we talked about. I'm keeping my lows position as is, so this is fine. Uh, KKR, so it's about 3% of my portfolio. I'd like to get it up to about 6%. I really like this alternative asset management space. The more and more that I learn about it, the more I like it. And again, when a lot of their capital is perpetual or when it's long dated in nature, it's it's super great because you can kind of forecast the earnings that are going to be earned from this capital by these companies. So and again, KKR, I think they have a great runway for growth. Their, they've, their investor day presentation, they were talking about how they want to own great businesses for the long term like Berkshire. And through their private equity business, they believe they're going to start continue or start to earn significant dividends so there's they were showing anywhere from 300 million to 600 million in annual dividends for the next five to seven years i believe so i think they're going to continue to operate these private equity businesses in a very efficient manner and they're also going to focus out and branch out into the alternative asset space segments so again real estate they have a big uh a focus on private credit already but again those are growing growing segments and then they're also going to be focusing huge on infrastructure as well and out on the eastern side of the world which i think is actually a demographic i would like to have more more exposure to again my companies are global mostly they do have exposure mostly everywhere but i don't really have a significant asia uh I guess you would like to call it demographic in my portfolio. So I want a company with a focus on Asia and an aging population out there and the capital out there because I think that's where a lot of growth is going to come from in the future. So those are basically the positions that I'm looking to build out right now and all the other ones I'm pretty comfortable with right now. Again, if I seek opportunity here in any of these companies and I want to add to it, I will. But for right now, I'm kind of focusing on adding to these. So that's Visa, Costco if I can, EQ Bank, Amazon, uh, KKR, and also here I missed, but ATD as well if, if price allows. So. So that was my stocks. Now, as we can look at my annual dividend income per stock, I'm focusing more on percentages here because I feel like that's a little more relevant to everybody. Everybody's dollar value is a little different. I feel like percentages is probably the way to go. So the annual dividend income that I get per stock. So really, the REITs, the banks, and the asset managers are going to be paying me a lot more current dividends. But then on the back half is where I'm going to get a lot more of the dividend growth, I believe. So Brookfield Asset Management, it has about a 4% yield and it pays me about 17% of my total dividend income. We have Avery Realty, pays me about 10%, JP Morgan at 10%, National Bank at 9%, Brookfield Corp at 7%, Amex at about 6.5%, Microsoft at 6%, EQ Bank at almost 6%, Lowe's and Home Depot at about 5% each, Union Pacific at 3.7%, Visa at 2.5%, Apple at 2.5%, CP Rail at 2.4%, Alimentation Couche Tart at 2%, Costco at 1.6%, KKR at 1.5%, and Google, they started paying their dividends, so they're paying about 0.7% of my total dividend income here. All right, so let's look at my gains and my losses here. As a percentage, again, you can look at the dollar value in this one if you want, you can pause, but I'm going to be looking at them as a percentage. So, Costco, like I said, is the highest gain position in my portfolio, I'm up about 100%. So it's kind of doubled. The valuations got crazy since I bought in. In my opinion, uh, I think it's a great company. I'm not selling it because I, I don't know when I'd be able to buy Costco again for a cheap valuation. That's Costco is one of these companies where the valuation can get stretched and then it can compress a little, but then it can get stretched again just because of their moat and their business, their management. They're just such a great company. So I don't want to sell any of the position of the position. I'm up at about hundred percent here. And it is my largest gain position. Then we have uh, Microsoft and JP Morgan at about 68, 69% gain in each. So I'm pretty happy with those. I do like those positions. Uh, JP Morgan, just a well-run oiled machine. Jamie Dimon uh, keeps it going for, <laughs> for 
for what seems like uh, a neon now, he's 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 been able to make these acquisitions, these other smaller financial institutions, a lot of them favored by the government. Again, that's a different topic, but they've been able to integrate those and get a lot of assets for uh, what I like to call pretty cheap prices. Microsoft, like we said, they've just been chugging along. Cloud growth has been great over the past couple of years. Now, we have also American Express. So that's my next largest gain at about 50%. So... I was looking at American Express back when it was in the 140s, 150s, 160s. I was adding heavily there. Um, average cost was around the 150-ish mark, I believe. I'd have to check that again. But again, it's it's just been a nice, steady growing business. Double-digit earnings per share growth. They focus on the affluent consumer. And they've just continued to forecast double-digit earnings per share growth. As they raise fees, they offer rewards and they continue to be very disciplined with their capital. Now, Apple, I'm up about 45% here, like you can see. And, and like I said before, I, I laid out my thesis, but Apple has been a great position here, in my opinion. And then we have Visa and Google. So Visa here, I'm up about 30%. It's just a great company, payment processing, very capital light. They just produce a bunch of cash flow and then pay it all out to shareholders or reward shareholders with that cash flow via dividends or share buybacks and google i'm up about 26 percent here as well and then i have some other positions like brookfield i'm up about 19 percent and we have brookfield asset management i'm up about 10 percent and again th these are all just the actual stock price appreciation not counting the dividend here so i am up actually a little bit more on these positions cp rail up 11 percent un or lows i'm up about 13 percent kkr is up about a, almost 16 percent National Bank up about 19%. Home Depot, UNP. Again, these are all like low double digit gainers, which I'm very, very happy with. I really do only have one position that is in the negative, or I'm kind of in a artificial unrealized loss in, which is ATD or Alimentation Couche Tard, down about 1.5%. So again, this was a newer position. It's trading at about probably fair value right now. So I'm slowly averaging into this one. And I think over the long term, this is going to be one of the best performers in my portfolio. So that was my portfolio's gains and losses. And if you wanted to look at them as a dollar value, you could look at them here and you can totally feel free to pause or whatever and look at each position as a dollar value if you want. I just focus on the percentage, like I said, because the percentage is what's really important. The dollar value per investor or per their portfolio will change based on where they are in life and how much they contribute, etc. So if I scroll down a bit, you can see the dollar value of my portfolio, the dividend income that I generate. So I generate about $564 or US dollars in this portfolio, which is not a super large amount of dividends when you think about it. And when you convert that to Canadian, it's about $773. But I'm focused more on dividend growth. I've transitioned my strategy from focusing on uh, current yield. I have a whole separate set of portfolios where i have a much larger yield which is closer to three and three and a half percent and the dividend yield here on this portfolio because it's focused more on dividend growth and capital appreciation is only about 1.19 percent so this is going to be a lot lower of a yield uh dividend uh portfolio more focused on capital appreciation and high dividend growth so you can see this information here which is again if you want to look at usd or canadian um, I'll look at a Canadian here. You can see the book value is about 53000 The market value is about 64000 So I'm up about 11000 here, almost 12000 which is about $22,000 in the green. Or not 22000 22% here. And you can see the current dividend yield here as well. And the market values are here, and you can see that I'm up about 11000 The total portfolio value is approaching that $64,000, $65,000 mark. So that was my dividend portfolio update. I know it's been a while. Sorry, life just kind of got a little busy, but I kind of laid out the thesis behind a lot of my companies. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave those in the comments section below. And with that, I will see you in the next video. Thank you for listening and I hope you have a great day. Bye. Please note I am not a financial advisor by any means. All of this information is merely for your entertainment purposes only. Please do your own due diligence when investing in stocks. Stocks are inherently risky and you can lose money and I am not liable for any investing decisions or losses you incur. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.